Access your free language gifts right now, before they expire. Here's what you're getting this month. First, can you talk about your feelings? You'll be able to with the brand new Feelings PDF Conversation Cheat Sheet. You'll learn all the must-know emotions in your target language. Second, if you love to eat, then you'll love this. The brand new Food Words and Phrases PDF eBook. Learn to talk about food with this PDF. Download it for free right now. Third, the 50 most common nouns that all beginners should know. Do you know all of these nouns? If not, this lesson will teach you the 50 must-know nouns fast. Learn them effortlessly with the audio slideshow tool inside. Fourth, learn how to fill out forms in your target language. This one-minute lesson teaches you all of the words you'll see on administrative forms. Fifth, want the best language learning app? Download Innovative Language 101 for free for the Android, iPhone, and iPad. You'll learn language fast and start speaking in minutes because the audio and video lessons are just three to 15 minutes long. And finally, the deal of the month. If you want to learn the language in six months with lessons by real teachers and our complete language learning program, then get up to 45% off six month premium or premium plus with the six month challenge sale. To get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the lesson description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hi everybody, welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're gonna talk about 10 phrasal verbs for business. So let's go. Step up. The first phrasal verb is step up. Step up means to move up or to level up, usually to some kind of new challenging position or to a challenging project. So I want to step up and do more for my company, or I want to step up and take on this project. There's a nuance of a challenge, a move upward, a promotion perhaps, and new challenges, new responsibilities. So in a sentence, the new CEO really stepped up on this project. Great. Step down. The next word is the opposite, step down. To step down uh, often means to resign or to quit one's job, especially at the higher levels of business. So a CEO might step down from his position or her position if they've made a big mistake or if the company has had problems. Uh, so sometimes this can mean resign. Sometimes this means just uh, moving to a lower position in the company. You can, you'll have to look into the specifics of the situation to figure out exactly the meaning. But step down means to go to a position of lower responsibility. So in a sentence, following multiple serious mistakes, the government official stepped down. Measure up. The next expression is measure up. Measure up is a word or a phrasal verb that we use to mean compare. Uh, we say, how does something measure up or does this measure up to? Meaning, is item A equal to item B? Is item A better than item B? This is a question or a word that we use to ask how one thing compares to another thing. So like, how does candidate A measure up to candidate B is a question of comparison between these two, these two items. Or does this project measure up to our past work? In other words, is this project equal to or is it uh, comparable to our past works? So measure up is used when comparing two things. So in a sentence, how does the new plan measure up to our past ideas? Step aside. The next expression, we've talked about step up, step down. Now we'll talk about step aside. So step aside means to move out of the way. It doesn't mean necessarily to move up in, in position or to move down in position. But step aside means uh, just temporarily to remove someone or to remove yourself from a situation. So uh, you can use this not just in business, but uh, maybe in a very crowded space, like let's step aside and have this discussion. You can use that in a business meeting as well. To step aside is to remove yourself from a main group or from one situation, go away from that situation temporarily. Hmm. That's how we use step aside. So in a sentence, the company feels you should step aside, like please move away from this project. Ooh. Swoop in. 
the next expression is swoop in, swoop in. So we use swoop,、uh, for example, with birds.、Uh, we can say the bird swooped in. But in a business situation,、uh, it's somebody, usually someone,、uh, a person, or maybe a team that suddenly joins the company or suddenly joins a project and maybe makes a lot of changes. So, for example.、Uh, A consulting firm might swoop in to a situation, or might swoop into a project, or maybe the boss swooped into the meeting and made a lot of changes. So these、uh, these sentences, these are situations where something suddenly happens by a one person or by a group of people. In another sentence, the consultant swooped in and changed around our entire organization. Shake up. The next phrasal verb is shake up. Shake up means to make a lot of changes at one time, or to maybe change an atmosphere, or to change a company feeling.、Uh, this can also be applied to situations outside of work, like maybe、uh, art, for example,、uh, other industries,、uh, manufacturing industry. It means to make changes. For, so one person or one group makes changes. So you could say, for example. Apple shook up the smartphone industry when it introduced the iPhone. So it means to make changes or to bring about new change. In a sentence, she really shook up our department with her innovative ideas. Come online.、Uh, the next expression is come online. Come online. So this is interesting. Of course, you're watching this video, presumably, probably, on the internet, online right now. But the expression "come online" means become able to use something, usually publicly or at least within your company.、Um, so when a new project comes online, it means it's it's now available. It can be used or it can be purchased.、Um, we typically use this expression for some kind of service. So, for example, a web platform or Um, an application or something that other people can use. So, come online means become available. Come online means become available. In a sentence, then, our new service is going to come online at the end of the month. Expand into. The next expression is expand into. Expand into. So we can use expand into to mean moving more or moving. To another place or to another industry with your business operations.、Uh, so we can use perhaps a country or a region after this expression, or we can use an industry name after this expression. So you can say we want to expand into China, we want to expand into Japan with our business, or you can say we want to expand into the electronics industry, we want to expand into the service industry. Expanding、uh, into something. Talks about the direction you want your company to move in, expand into. So, in a sentence, we'd like to expand into some other markets. To bring about. The next expression is to bring about. To bring about means to make something happen, to cause something to happen. We often use this to talk about change.、Uh, it can be positive or it can be negative. I feel I tend to use this more in a positive situation, but that might just be me. Um, so to bring about means to cause something or yeah to make something happen. In a sentence, don't you think we should try to bring about change in our company? Take on. The next expression is take on. So take on. If you if you can kind of make a visual with this phrasal verb, you can take something and attach it to yourself to take on something. But this thing you're taking is responsibility. Uh, so to take on something、uh, has the nuance of a challenge or a new responsibility.、Uh, it's something that is generally seen as positive, but、uh, perhaps could be maybe a lot of new work or a big new project, for example.、Uh, so I might say, I want to take on some new projects this year. Or you could use it outside of business, like in a kind of aggressive situation, like like I tried to take on a really big guy at the club, <laughs> but he punched me. So <laughs> you could use this too, but it has the nuance of challenge every every time you use it. So in a different sentence, I was asked to take on more responsibilities at the office.、Uh, oh, that's the end. So those are ten phrasal verbs for business. I hope that those are useful for you.、Uh, if they are, please let us know in the comments. If you have any questions, also please let us know there too. 
If you haven't already, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Also, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and we will see you again soon. Bye. Welcome to UsherTalk101.com, <laughs> where we talk about Usher lyrics and analyze them far too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's an old song, isn't it? Yeah. But I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everybody and welcome back to Top Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to talk about 10 crime related words. So let's begin. Suspect. The first word is suspect. Suspect as a noun. Please be careful. Not the verb form to suspect, though we can use that. Suspect and suspect have slightly different pronunciations. As a noun, suspect means a person who may or may not have committed a crime, may or may not have done something bad. To suspect someone means to be suspicious, to think they may or may not have done something. So please be careful depending on the grammar. Uh, suspect and suspect have different pronunciations despite the same spelling. So suspect, in a sentence, the suspect was seen running away from the scene. Criminal. The next expression is criminal. So a criminal is a person who is convicted of a crime. So to put that more simply, a criminal is a person who has been determined to have done something against the law. They have done something bad. It has been decided uh, by a court of law or the governing body. So a criminal has indeed, yes, uh, been found guilty, an expression we'll talk about later. So a criminal is someone we know has committed a crime. In a sentence, they arrested the criminal on Wednesday. Victim. The next expression is victim. Victim. A victim is a person who suffers because of a crime or because of a natural disaster. Also, we can use victims for natural disasters and for crimes. So they are innocent. They are, they've had no reason to be affected. Uh, they're just maybe the wrong place, the wrong time. Uh, either way, they are, well, I shouldn't say innocent, but they are the person who suffers in this situation. A victim is the person who suffers in this situation. In a sentence, the victim was an elderly woman. Guilty. So the next expression is guilty. He is guilty of blah, blah, blah crime, or he was found guilty of blah, blah, blah crime. The nuance of guilty is having done something bad. Mm. So if you are guilty of a crime, it means you have done that crime. Mm. But someone can look guilty. We can use guilty as an adjective to talk about the way someone looks. So guilty in a court or guilty in discussing a criminal case can mean uh, he or she did the crime. He is guilty. She is guilty. However, we can say he looks guilty or the dog looks guilty. That means that that person or that object or that animal looks like they did something bad, but we don't know for sure. So guilty means uh, has the nuance of doing something bad. In a sentence, you look very guilty. Not guilty. Okay, so on the other hand, not guilty. Not guilty is the verdict. So verdict is the word used for decision in criminal cases. Not guilty means uh, not doing the crime. The crime was not done by that person. So a person who is found or determined not guilty means they did not do the crime or it's been decided that that person did not do the crime. They are not guilty. Hmm. Okay, in a sentence, he was found not guilty of the crime. To plead. To plead. So to plead is similar to to beg. So to plead means to humbly request something. It's this, this is the image of pleading, like your hands together, hoping very much for something, asking very humbly for something. But this is the verb that we use in court cases, in criminal cases. So we'll say, uh, I want to plead not guilty for the crime of blah, blah, blah. So to plead uh, means to request consideration for something. So I want to plead not guilty means I want to request you, the court, the judge, whoever, my community, you find me, you consider me not guilty. I did not do the crime. So, uh, but we use, instead of that very long expression, we say, I plead not guilty. This is a much easier way to express that situation. Of course, you can plead guilty to a crime too, in some cases. So he pled, this is past tense, 
to plead uh, changes to pled. He pled guilty to the crime of manslaughter, for example. So in the sentence, uh, the defendant pled not guilty. Murder, homicide. So the next expression, uh, I have murder and homicide here. So murder and homicide, if you watch police shows or if you watch, you know, movies, dramas, which use uh, like police and FBI and so on, you might have heard these words. But what's the difference? So murder and homicide are used uh, to mean the same thing. It means killing another person with intention. So to murder someone else means to kill another person and with intention. There's a plan to do it. Homicide is the word that is used in legal terminology or in forensic. Uh, forensic meaning uh, analysis of bodies, analysis of like blood, for example, of bacteria. So kind of uh, scientific analysis of a crime scene. Um, so in those cases, in the investigation side and in the legal side, they might use the word homicide perhaps more. Uh, you might also hear homicide in news. But in everyday conversation, uh, murder is perhaps more common. So uh, the defendant was convicted of murder. The defendant was found guilty of murder. In a sentence, she was found guilty of murder. Manslaughter. All right, so another expression, manslaughter. This is an interesting word. So manslaughter, uh, you can see the word slaughter is there. So slaughter refers to killing something. We use slaughter uh, in many cases to refer to slaughterhouses where cattle are killed, like pigs and cows, for example. Uh, so it has the image of like brutally killing. However, manslaughter refers to an accidental killing. So for example, driving in a car and just through some strange accident, um, maybe a person uh, is hit by the car and they die. But there was no intention on the part of the driver. There was no plan there. It was an accident, a terrible, terrible accident. In those cases, the word manslaughter is applied, uh, meaning an accidental death. So in a sentence, this is a case of manslaughter. Jury. The next expression is jury. Jury. You may or may not have a jury system in your country. In the U.S. jury system, there's a jury of your peers. So peers are people in your community, people in theory who are similar to you in some way. So a jury is a group of people who makes a decision about a court case. You often have to give a presentation to a jury. So yeah, you might see these uh, juries, that is in movies and in TV shows about crime as well. In a sentence, the jury was divided on the case, meaning the jury did not know how to vote. Yes or no, guilty, not guilty. Judge. The next expression is judge, judge. So uh, again, your country may or may not have something similar, but a judge is kind of, uh, if, you, if you've watched like US crime shows or whatever, you might have seen these people, they're, uh, men and women who wear like these big black robes usually and they sit high in courtrooms above the other people usually. We also have in the U.S. the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is our, well, supreme meaning most high, the best, the highest level. Uh, the Supreme Court where we have uh, what we call justices, but those, those are essentially like they are uh, judges really. They are the highest level of judge in the U.S. Um, so they have a special word, justice, but they are judges. So they make decisions based on the law, based on uh, the legal rules of the country or, or of the city or of the location where you are. A judge does that. So in a sentence, the judge had a tough decision to make. No. Oh, that's the end. All right. Uh, so those are 10 crime-related words. I hope that those are useful for you. Keep an eye out for these, or keep an ear out for these, rather. You might hear them in TV shows and movies, in the news as well. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, also, if you have any questions or any comments, please make sure to leave us a message in the comment section below. Check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff. And thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words. We'll see you again soon. Hi everybody and welcome back to Tough Words. My name is Alicia and today we're going to talk about 10 phrasal verbs for talking about vehicles. Let's go! The first phrasal verb, the first phrasal verb is pull in. Pull in. So pull in is used usually when you're driving very slowly. We usually use it for a parking lot. So we'll use it in an expression like pull into that space or pull in over there. In this sentence, 
pull into that space over there. It means usually to slowly move your car into a space, into a parking space, or maybe into a garage. You're going into something usually very slowly. So pull in over here, pull in over there, pull into that parking lot, pull into that driveway, for example. So slowly move into another place. We use the phrasal verb pull in for that. The next phrasal verb is pull up, pull up. In this sentence, I'll pull the car up in front of the hotel. We usually use this um, when we want to slowly drive and then stop at a location. So for example, at a stoplight, we would say pull up to the stoplight. So it means to slowly drive to a place and then stop. So pull up next to the mailbox or pull up next to my house, pull up over there means slowly drive and then stop at that place is pull up. That's how we use pull up. The next expression is back up. Back up, so back means reverse. To back up a car is to move a car slowly in reverse. So usually, uh, in most cases, we drive cars going forward, but you sometimes need to move your car in the opposite direction. Back up out of the driveway, for example. It means to go slowly in reverse, to back up. In this sentence, the truck backed up until it touched the loading dock. The next expression, we talked about pull in, now we have back in, back in. So pull in means to drive forward into something, Back in means to slowly go backward into something, usually a parking space or a garage or something. So back in is going rever in reverse, pull in is going forward uh, as usual. So in a sentence, back into the parking space. The next expression is roll down. Roll down. This might be a little bit of an outdated expression at this point in time. But prior to the use of automatic windows, uh, usually now I think most cars have a button and the window will automatically roll down. But we used to have a manual, a hand crank in, in cars to roll down windows. So this motion, which was used um, to move the window, that was, the, that was also the verb we used. We used roll, so this motion is like roll and then the window comes down. So we combined the two to say roll down the window. In a sentence, roll down your window, it's hot in here. The next expression is head up and head down. These are very common expressions when you are trying to navigate in a city. You don't have to use these only in cars. You can use them when you're walking or traveling on foot as well, on bicycle, whatever. You can use head up and head down anytime you are trying to go somewhere. So head up and head down really just mean go. So I could say like head up the street until you see a Starbucks and then turn right. Generally though, the difference between up and down here, it has kind of like a north and south, at least in English, it has a north-south sort of feel. So if, for example, I'm talking about um, well, the west coast of the USA, Seattle is in the north and Los Angeles is in the south, I would say uh, I'm heading down, I'm going to head down to Los Angeles from Seattle, or I'm going to head up to Seattle from Los Angeles. It sounds really strange if I say head up to Los Angeles because Los Angeles is south of Seattle. So uh, when you're thinking, when you're speaking geographically, when you're speaking in terms of north and south for places, it's better to use head up or head down depending on the location um, you're talking about coming from. Let's see, in this sentence, head down this street for a while. The next expression is run over, run over. This is a, this is a word that we use uh, when in a car, let's say you're driving your car and then an animal comes out in front of the car, but you continue going. We say you are going to run over. So to run in this case is not a human running, but a car running. So the car is running, is going, is continuing over something else. So we can say like, don't run over any animals or be careful not to run over your brother. In this example sentence, I think you ran over a squirrel. True story, my little brother once ran over me in a golf cart. That is true. Uh, my brother and I were playing one time 
and my grandparents had a golf cart and my brother and I were outside running around. We were playing like a James Bond, like kind of spy game, like where we're like, okay, I'm gonna drive the golf cart and you have to run alongside and jump in. And I was like, okay, but I tried to jump. I don't know, I got nervous, but it, was, it wasn't really going that fast, but like somehow things went wrong and I fell down or maybe I tripped or something like that while I was running. I fell down and he just, he ran over me <laughs> in the golf cart, like ran over my leg, just drove right over my leg. And I was like, ah, <laughs> we got in big trouble. <laughs> I was fine, yeah, no, I died. Uh, the next word is pull over. So pull over means uh, usually you are driving the car and you want to make a stop. So usually we use this like on the side of the road or in a place where you wouldn't usually stop or in kind of a strange, not necessarily strange, but maybe not a typical place to stop a car. So for example, if there's like a bee in the car <laughs> and you're like, ah, I need to get this bee out of my car. You can pull over to the side of the road. We usually use it like pull over to the side of the road and you know, do what you need to do. Or maybe you need to pull over at a rest stop, pull over at a bathroom essentially. Okay, so in a sentence, pull over at the next rest stop. Yeah, so pull over is also used by the police as well as like a command. It's a, it's a temporary situation. So the police are going to stop you. They say, pull over to the side of the road. And then you have to move your car to the side of the road where it's safe and they talk to you and then you can continue down the road after you've finished speaking to them. Police will use it as a command. The next phrasal verb is pull out, pull out. So for example, when you are uh, coming out of a parking space, for example, you can say like pull out of this parking space and turn left. Uh, it means like to exit something slowly. So to pull out of a parking space or to pull out into traffic. So turning from one, one lane to another, maybe busier lane. The image is going kind of slowly and then picking up the pace somewhere else. So to pull out into is another common expression. Pull out into traffic or pull out of a space and turn left or pull out of the driveway, for example. In this example sentence, a super slow truck pulled out in front of us on the mountain road. The next expression is get on get on. We use get on usually for large roads. So a highway or a major street, uh, usually the traffic is moving very quickly. We say get on the highway, get on the five. So like in the US, lots of highways, major roads are labeled with numbers. So like California, one, a big state highway is the number five highway, the five. So you could say like get on the five at the next exit or get on the five at the street, for example. So to get on means like to, to join with your car that uh, major road. In a sentence, get on the highway here. Okay, so that's the end. Those are 10 phrasal verbs for talking about vehicles. I hope that those were useful and some of these phrasal verbs you can use in situations other than cars uh, and automobiles. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments, please let us know in the comment section below. Please, please, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more stuff. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and we'll see you again soon. Bye! Hi everybody, welcome back to Know Your Verbs. My name is Alicia, and in this episode, we're going to talk about the verb die. Okay. Let's begin with the basic definition of this verb. The basic definition of the verb die is to stop living or to stop existing. Examples. She died yesterday. Doctors say he might die within a year. Let's look at the conjugations for this verb. Present. Die. Dies. Past. Died. Past participle. Died. Progressive. Dying. So now let's talk about some additional meanings for this verb. The first additional meaning for this lesson is to disappear gradually. Some examples. The noise died down a short while after the concert ended. My interest in eating meat died after I watched a documentary. So in both of these examples, something gradually decreased. In the first example sentence, after a concert ended, the noise died down. So actually, we can say died down to like, it sounds like it, it was up here. Like, because we're using the word down there, it sounds like the volume was up here maybe, and it gradually came down. So the noise died 
is okay, like the noise died after, but the noise died down sounds even more gradual. So this is sort of a, like an extra variation on this meaning. In the second example sentence, uh, we saw my interest in eating meat died after I watched the documentary. So it's like, oh, I saw this documentary and my desire to eat meat went down quickly. Like it died, it stopped, it ceased. Uh, so that sounds like, oh no, I saw this documentary and I was done wanting to eat meat. So it kind of means to go away or to disappear. So especially with down, like to die down, that sounds extra gradual. Okay, good. Let's talk about the next one. Okay, so the second additional meaning for today's lesson is to stop working like a machine or a computer. Examples. My car is dying on the side of the road. Oh no! My phone battery died. Oh no, I have a graphic for this. Oh no, my phone battery died. That's not true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so, so in both of these examples, we use die to mean that some machine or some device stopped working, usually because it ran out of power or because there's some technical malfunction. So in the first example, my car is dying on the side of the road. There could be a number of reasons why the car is dying. Maybe it's out of gas. Maybe there's like a technical problem. Uh, maybe it's just, I don't know, something else has gone wrong. We don't know. But for whatever reason, the car is not moving or the car is not functioning correctly. So the car is dying on the side of the road. In the second example, a very common one, oh no, my phone battery died. In the past tense, it means my phone ran out of battery. My phone ran out of power, out of energy. So we say, my phone died. We don't even need to say battery, just my phone died is perfect. That's a very natural sentence. Oh no, my phone died. So those are a couple additional meanings. Excellent. Now, let's go on to some variations for the verb die. So the first variation I want to talk about is to die of an emotion or to die of a feeling. So this is an expression we use when we feel that thing, that emotion, that sensation very strongly. So strongly, we feel like we could die of, or we can also say die from that thing. Examples. I could die of happiness. And I'm dying of hunger. So in the first example, I could die of happiness. Uh, that's an example where we could substitute of for from. So I'm, I could die from happiness. That's also okay. We could say, I could die of embarrassment, or I could die from embarrassment, or sadness, or loneliness, something like that. Uh, it's an emotion we feel so strongly, we feel like we could die because of it. In the second example sentence, I use the progressive. I'm dying of hunger. It means I'm so hungry, I feel like I could die. But I'm using the progressive tense, which means I feel this way now. I'm dying now because I'm so hungry. Dying of hunger means at this moment, you are dying. Well, not literally, but you are so hungry, you feel like you're dying. I'm dying of hunger. All right, let's go on to the next thing. So. Let's go on to the next variation. The next variation is to be dying to verb. So to be dying to do something. Examples. So to be dying to do something means you have a very, very strong desire to do that thing. You really, really want to do this thing. So examples of that. I'm dying to see that movie. He's dying to go home. So in both of these sentences, you see I'm using the infinitive form of the verb after dying. He's dying to, she's dying to, I'm dying to do something. We need to use to plus the verb. That's the infinitive form of the verb. So dying to do that thing means the speaker or the subject really, really wants to do that action, that verb. So that's what it means to be dying to do something. You're not actually dying. It just means you have a strong desire to do that thing. All right, good. So those are a few variations, a couple of additional meanings. I hope that you picked up some new ways to use the verb die. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, or if you know a different way to use the verb die, or if you just would like to try to make an example sentence, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Of course, don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you liked the video, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other good study resources. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Know Your Verbs, and we'll see you again soon. Bye! Die! <laughs> Dying to be! 
alive. <laughs> yeah, that's a Hanson song. Anybody yeah. listen to Hanson? This is how I. This is how I express a strong desire to do something. I go like this. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question this week comes from Sanju. Hi again, Sanju. Sanju says, hey Alicia, how can I think fully in my target language? Whenever I see you speaking fluently, I feel like I want to become like you. So how can I make my communication like yours? Ah, this is a very common question. And it requires practice. It requires regular practice. So this means you need to practice a little bit every day where you can immerse yourself in the language you're studying. If you're studying English, try to use English as much as possible in your day. So if you can, try to make a time in your week or in your day when you only speak English or you only read English. So try to read English books, watch English TV or movies, listen to music in English, talk to people in English where you can. You need to get used to using it in your everyday life so that your brain gets used to using it when you're just thinking about things. So this takes time, absolutely. You need to practice and you need to give yourself time every day and every week to get used to doing this. So practice every day, practice regularly. Of course, if you really want to practice speaking like me, you can mimic me, you can shadow me if you want. But please keep in mind, as I've said on this channel before, I'm speaking in a way that's helpful for learners. So I'm trying to use very clear pronunciation. I'm trying to use kind of simple grammar or grammar that's not super complex. Um, and I'm also not speaking in exactly the same way that native speakers do in everyday conversation. So please remember that the way I speak on this channel is not necessarily the way that native speakers talk in everyday life. That being said, if you want to use me for your shadowing practice, please feel free. You won't have any communication problem if you practice speaking like me. So I hope that this helps you. If you're interested, there are some other videos on the channel that have lots of tips about how to think in your target language and how to get used to applying English in your everyday life. So definitely check those out too. Okay, I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for the question. All right, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Eric Pashkov. Hi, Eric. Eric says, what's the difference between present perfect and past perfect. Okay, uh, present perfect is used, one, for general life experience in the past at a non-specific point in time. This can be an experience you had or an experience you did not have. So when the point in time is not important, we can use present perfect to talk about that. For example, I have been to France. I have never written a book. We also use present perfect tense to talk about actions that started in the past and continue to the present, or the effects of that action continue to the present. You'll see verbs used with progressive tense in this case too. So for example, have been plus the ing form of a verb. We also commonly use for and since to talk about the entire length of time an action has happened, or has been happening rather. So for example, uh, I have been speaking for about four minutes, or he has been listening to me since I started this video. So this is a common way that we use present perfect tense. Past perfect, on the other hand, refers to things that happened in the past. So we're not talking about the relationship between the past and the present. We're talking about the relationship between a past action and some other past point. So, for example, I had been studying for three hours when I fell asleep. So in that example sentence, we see that there was one past continuing action and a second action that happened closer to the present that interrupted the action, when I fell asleep. So we can use past perfect tense to show like sequences. If you're telling a story and there are two points in your story that were in the past, you can use past perfect tense to explain the thing that came first then use simple past to explain the thing that happened nearer to the present, as I did in this story. As I also mentioned in this example sentence, if you want to describe a past action that was continuing and that was then interrupted, you can use this pattern, this past perfect to simple past tense pattern. 
So we use it for that. We also use it to talk about life experience, again, so general life experience or no life experience, but at a past point in time. So for example, uh, by my 10th birthday, I had saved $100, for example. So by my 10th birthday is a point in the past. I'm obviously not 10 years old now. So by my 10th birthday, I had saved. That means up until that point in time, I had saved $100. So when we want to talk about past experiences in relation to other past points, we can use the past perfect tense. So you can find some other videos about present perfect tense and soon about past perfect tense on the channel soon. So I hope that you check those out for some more information. I hope that this helps you too. Thanks very much for the question. All right, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Hanas Bayou. Hi, Hanas. Hanas says, what's the difference between follow and subscribe? Because they have the same meaning. Okay. Um, for online media hubs like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, they have the same feeling, they have the same meaning. Like you click the button and you receive updates from that person or from that company or whatever. Um, in terms of kind of a more historical meaning though, the word subscribe was and is used for regular publications. So for example, we subscribe to a magazine or we subscribe to a newspaper. When you subscribe to something, there's an expectation that you will receive that thing on a regular basis, on a regular schedule. So for example, if you subscribe to a monthly magazine, you expect to receive the magazine once a month. That's a subscription. So the same word carries over into YouTube. When we subscribe to someone's channel, we expect to see their content. We expect that when that person creates something, we are going to receive it. So in YouTube's case, this means we have like, you know, a channels you follow list or we see like something in our email that says, oh, this channel has posted a new video. So subscribe in this way means like you have some kind of expectation of receiving something somewhat regularly. Of course, not everyone on YouTube posts regularly, but this is the idea. To follow, however, like with Twitter or with Facebook or Instagram, um, is like you're just waiting for updates from that person. Maybe you're not expecting to receive something on a regular basis, but if that person or that company or brand or whatever chooses to share something, you're saying you want to have the ability to quickly and easily check that thing. So this is why we don't really use like subscribe for Twitter or subscribe on Facebook or on Instagram. It sounds more like a service. For YouTube though, it makes sense because it's like we're getting something regularly. Many people on YouTube create content regularly. So subscribe is a better fit in this case. Okay, so I hope that this helps answer your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. All right, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Abrar. Hi, Abrar. Abrar says, are like and seems the same word? If not, what's the difference? And how do we use them? Thanks. Okay, it depends on how the words are used. We can use both of these words to share our opinion of someone or something, like in these example sentences. She seems nice. She seems like a nice person. Notice how in the first example sentence here, we follow seems with an adjective. She seems nice. In the second example sentence, she seems like a nice person. We're using like, and we need to follow this with a noun phrase. So a nice person is a noun phrase. When you're using like in this way, you need to follow like with a noun phrase. You can't use an adjective there as we did with seems. So we follow the same rule when we're using like to make comparisons. For example, he eats like a pig. You look like my brother. So when we're making comparisons like this, we need to use a noun phrase after the word like. Also, we can use seems with verbs. For example, this seems to be the right answer. He seems to like hiking. So another quick point about the word seems is that we use seem or seems when we want to make a guess or share an opinion about something, but maybe we can't quickly confirm. So like she seems nice, it's like our opinion, our quick opinion of that person, but maybe we don't know yet. She might not be a nice person, we don't know. 
But when you want to make a quick guess about something that you can't actually check, you can't really confirm, you can use seems to do that. In the second original example sentence I introduced, she seems like a nice person, we're combining seem with like there. So she seems like, that means it's like you're comparing this person, she, to a nice person. That's kind of the idea here. So she has the appearance, or I guess, she seems as though she is a nice person. So this is an overcomplicated explanation, but think about using like when you want to compare things. Think about using seem when you want to maybe just share a simple adjective or maybe when you want to make a quick guess about someone. So I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for the question. All right, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Junior. Hi, Junior. Junior says, hi, Alicia. Someone once said to me, you're neat. And I was kind of confused. What does it mean? Okay, uh, neat is kind of like a cute word or a nice word that means cool or interesting. It sounds very casual, very friendly, maybe a little bit childish. We would use neat in the same way as we use cool, but cool is a little bit rough. Neat sounds kind of precious and nice and childish a little bit. So you can say that someone's drawing is neat or that someone is neat. However, there's a second meaning of neat, which means tidy or organized. So if someone like came to your house and said, wow, you're neat, like to talk about the way that your house is organized or like to comment about how clean your space is, it could have this meaning. So it depends. How did the person use the word when they were speaking to you? What was the situation? So it can mean cool, great, awesome, nice, or it can mean tidy and organized. Some other examples. I saw that movie. It was neat. My new computer is neat. Your parents are really neat, aren't they? Okay, so I hope that this helps answer your question. Thanks very much. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending your questions. Remember, you can send them to me at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.